As promised, folks, when we crossed 100 students inside our school community, we were going to ask you, who would you like to talk to that's been on the channel in the past? And the number one request was the one and only Mr. Greg Dickerson. We talked every week for about three years. Greg was so great, gracious with his time. He would pull over on the road and take calls from his car. His story of truck in a toolbox is so impressive. It made it in my second book, 15 Conversations with Real Estate Millionaires. It is such a pleasure to invite the one and only Greg Dickerson back to the channel. Greg, how you doing, man? Doing great, Michael. Good to see you. I think uh, we were talking earlier. It's been since March of 2023, I think was the last time we talked. Yeah, I think the last time we spoke, yeah, we had a couple of one-offs, but it's been more than 18 months since we've done kind of our weekly thing, which was just a routine. It was always great to talk to you first on Monday morning, uh, at least Monday morning for me. It was, you know, early afternoon for you on the East Coast. Uh, why don't you do me a favor? Catch us up in the last 18 months of Mr. Greg Dickerson. What's been going on in your world? What have you been doing? What's 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 the word? You know, I've really been focused on markets, you know, over the last 18 months. You know, of course, I coach and mentor people all around the world doing all kinds of different things. But from a personal business, you know, standpoint, you know, I'm on the board of a couple of companies. Um, but my main investment focus has been in the markets. You know, I've done a few projects here and there, but just mostly um, cycled through those. And and like I said, just 100 percent focus on the markets. I mean, the last 18 months have just been on fire. What's really interesting is, is that you know, pretty much everything is playing out exactly like we had talked about all those years, you know, from the pandemic forward uh, in terms of, you know, where the economy is, where the consumer is, you know, where things are going. Uh, a couple of little surprises here and there, you know, along the way. But, you know, it's it's really interesting how things are playing out pretty much exactly like we yeah. talked about. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. And again, folks, if you don't remember, Greg Dickerson has an amazing playlist on this channel. I think it's just Greg. That was my that was my cool name, just Greg. So you can go back and watch three years of uh, us talking. And and it's it's really fun to catch up again uh, because again, eighteen months ago, it's it's really funny. If we really want to go back in time, thirty months ago, you were like, "Hey, Michael, I'm getting really busy. I have I have some big things in front of me. I don't know that I can continue doing this. Let's ask the audience." And then overwhelmingly, the audience just says, "Hey, stay." And you're like, okay, I'll give you another year. But then, like you said, you join boards, you had these other projects, and your time is 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 just is so valuable. Um the yeah, other it was thing the whole pandemic I, thing. I think we started up right, right yeah. before, right when the pandemic hit. And you know, I had a little bit more time on my hands then just because, you know, <laughs> yeah, I mean we all did. didn't go anywhere. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, then once we were able to get back out and about again, yeah, I was always on the road, going places, yeah. doing stuff and things yeah. like that. And yeah, it's, it's been, it's been a pretty, pretty interesting time. And, you know, over the last three years, and especially like I said, over the last 18 months or so. And, you know, one of the biggest things we talked about a lot was the, you know, this housing crash, you know, that was going to yeah. happen and everybody calling for a housing crash. And you, what did you and I say, you know, it's just, there's just not possible, you yeah. know, not, not right now, even with interest rates going to seven or 8%, you know, it did slow things down a bit. And we're seeing values come down, but they're still well above where they were pre-pandemic. We're still well yeah. above normal rates of appreciation. Even though you're seeing price declines in certain markets, you're seeing inventory, you know, stack up in certain markets. But we never saw a housing bust like you know mm -hmm. a lot of the the doomers out there are talking about. We never saw the Airbnb bust like a lot of people are talking about. You know, there and the things that we talked about was there's no inventory. Um, there's not enough inventory in the Airbnb market, short-term rentals to, to, even if they all went into foreclosure today, they would get absorbed. Mm -hmm. Uh, certain markets, you might have some issues, you know, like where you're moving yeah. and, you yeah. know, there's, there's a couple of markets around the country that are under pressure. Um, but most everywhere else in the country, you know, stuff, the right stuff at the right price is still selling in days with multiple offers. Yeah. Um, you know, the higher end stuff is starting to slow down a little bit in some markets, but other markets it's flying off the shelves and setting, yeah. you know, record prices, especially at the ultra high end, you know, uh, eight figure, nine figure, you know, sales in some markets, you know, it's really interesting what's going on there. So, yep. you know, it's like we said all along, it's all about supply and demand. And, you know, we are still short a lot of units in the, uh, in the housing market. And then the third thing was the commercial real estate bust that was going to take mm. down the economy and you know it's like we said all along that's not big enough to tank the economy and with commercial real estate you know there you can work through it there's more yep. time to work through the process um and there just there just wasn't enough exposure from the standpoint of the banks overall it's the equity investors that are getting wiped Correct. out 
Exactly. And we talked about syndicators that were, you know, paying too much for properties and getting short-term bridge loans. And we've seen a lot of those, you know, really, really blow up over the years. So yeah. you know, those are kind of the things that I've been watching, you know, come home to roost here. And, uh, you know, like I said, the, the real opportunities for me and for a lot of people have been in the markets over the last couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, folks, remember, folks, this is part of the school communities. One of the things you're paying for is access, access, access. You can either put comments or questions, excuse me, questions in the comments. I'm sorry, questions in the chat, or you can raise your hand uh, and we will give you an opportunity to ask Greg a question. So again, cool. uh, think about your questions, put them there. Uh, I got a couple more for Greg that I'll move on so you guys can think about what you would like to ask. Greg, you still able things... to add people as we're going or was that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. As more and more yeah. people are coming, I'll, I will add them. Oh, let's see. Did anybody? Oh, yeah. I'll add them as they come in. So yeah, gonna... one of the things that I remember, Greg, about your story, obviously, right? Truck in a toolbox is something you did in your journey was you started building, frankly, luxury homes. Right. That were, you know, kind of at a special spot, I think in South Carolina, kind of on the water or near the water. Um, one of the things that I see going forward is builders building smaller homes. I think one of the things that we're one of the answers to our housing market is we need more units. We don't need more McMansions. We need smaller homes. But obviously it has to pencil. Right. It has to make sense uh, as a ex builder. I don't know if you're ever really an ex-builder. As a builder who has really built homes, um, is it possible for us to build smaller homes and make money as a builder and help solve the problem? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's it's all about, you know, it's really funny how the market has gone through these peaks and valleys over the years. But, uh, yeah, um, during the pandemic, obviously, the demand for larger houses, you know, and the work from home spaces and the school from home spaces, you know, became a thing. But, you know, back in the ramp up to 0809, everybody was going bigger. The whole, that's where the whole McMansion yeah. move started. Then when, you know, when the economy contracted and the real estate market tanked, everybody, you know, started scaling back and going into smaller houses. And the reason, you know, builders are building smaller houses, uh, you know, is obviously price point, right? They're trying to bring yep. price down however they can. Uh, land cost is not changing much. You know, maybe they can do a little bit smaller lots and things like that, but the way that you bring prices down and, uh, you know, reach economies of scale, you can get more units, you know, on property, uh, you can build smaller units, so you can build more, you know, uh, affordable uh, product to meet the market demand, and things like that. And then, of course, you know, the big things that the builders can offer and are offering all over the country are buy downs, yeah. uh, you know, for people to be able to afford rates, like a lot of people, you know, don't think that you can still get four and a half, five percent interest rates, you can, uh, yeah. you know, with buy downs with interest only, uh, you know, some of those exotic products that, that we experienced in 809 are coming back. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways that uh, builders can achieve affordability. But your question was profitability. So, you know, sometimes smaller houses are even more profitable because you can get through them quicker. Right. Um, Speed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah quicker, yeah. easier to build. You know, luxury homes, they take a lot longer. They require, you know, skill sets and expertise that uh, is expensive and is in high demand. And, you know, a lot of people are exiting the trades, you know, in general across the country. So it's getting even more expensive to get labor. But the thing is, is that that skill set is not improving. We're seeing the right. quality of labor decline as prices continue to go up, uh, which is a very interesting thing. So from a builder standpoint, it's much easier to build a smaller house, just burn through them, mm -hmm. you know, because it's a time value of money thing, right? Um, you know, volume and sales can cure a lot of things. So if I can move a lot more product, I can be a lot more profitable. The big move for a lot of builders now and where the biggest opportunity is for a lot of builders is build for rent. You and I talked ah, about that when that yep. whole movement started. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of institutional equity that is attracted now to the build for rent movement versus multifamily because of the yep. stress in multifamily. And a lot of builders have just switched that build, build uh, their business model to delivering that product for institutional investors. Um you know, and they can be a lot more profitable there because you're just building rental units. You don't have a custom client. Uh, you don't have an end, you know, sale with mm -hmm. an end buyer. You know, you have one client, you're building a hundred thousand, you know, hundred houses, four thousand houses for yeah. way easier and way more profitable. So it's really interesting dynamics that we're seeing, you know, take place in the housing market right now. Yeah. We're going to get into build for it for a minute. I actually want to stay on the builders for a second. One of the things that I spoke with Lance Lambert, uh, CEO of Resi Club, right after Silicon Valley Bank crashed was given the commercial market, commercial lenders and, you know, really being hurt 
by Silicon Valley Bank and their balance sheets and all of that was we were going to see smaller builders pull back because either A, they couldn't afford it, or B, they couldn't get approved. And what we have seen transpire, it just the latest numbers came out about a week ago, is 51% of new construction is by the big builders, right? The publicly traded big builders. And just for context, back in 06, it was less than 25%. So I guess my question for you is, what is it going to take to bring the small builders back in mass? Um, is, is it going to take lower rates? Is it going to take some kind of fixing of commercial banks? How, how do we get the small builders back? Because just having the big ones, is it's not really a market when they dominate like that. Yeah, well, it's three things. One, it's land position. It's much more difficult for a small guy to get a position in land. So if anybody yeah. out there is in wholesale real estate, you know, there's a huge demand for land right now. If you can get, if you can find land that you can entitle for builders, there's a huge opportunity there for people. And that's kind of one of the things um, from a real estate standpoint I focused on over the last two years was delivering lots to builders mm -hmm. uh, because there's such a big appetite for it. Like I'm not interested in building anything because I'm not going to compete with the big guys. So number one, you need a land position. Number two, you need to be able to borrow the money. That's becoming more and more difficult. Even though builders are doing well, the residential market's doing well, banks are just pulling back in general. So credit has tightened a little bit. It's getting you know more difficult for people to get uh, financing, you know, to do spec builds. Although there there's alternatives out there, but the interest rates you know are higher um, than a lot of people are used to. Now, when I was building, you know, back when I got started, I mean, we was nine ten percent all day long. That was a decent mm. interest rate for construction loans, but cost profiles are very different. You know, land metrics were were very different. So, uh, and then the cost in general, you know, just to, because of the construction costs overall and carrying that project, a lot of builders can't do that. Uh, but there is a, you know, niche opportunity uh, for custom builders. So there's a lot of people that want a home built on their land, but there's not very many people that want to do that because it's more difficult. Um, mm -hmm. It's more risky than just building something and then selling it when you're done. So uh, there's still opportunity out there. I coach a lot of builders around the country that are scaling their businesses and there's, there's still opportunities, but you got to focus on the infill stuff. So yeah. you want to do covered land plays. You want to do infill. That's where the smaller builders can be more competitive. If you're not bankable, then find a partner who is, bring them in, let them be the balance sheet for you. If you need, you know, if you don't have the money for down payments and, you know, things like that, you can raise capital from investors or partner with people. So a lot of different ways that you can, you know, get some access in the market. But where I started and what I focused on was infill development, going into existing neighborhoods and finding vacant lots or doing teardowns where you could tear something down and free up two or three lots, you know, or more or 10 lots or 20 lots, you know, things like that. So you got to be nimble. You got to think, you know, outside the box and, you know, how can you create opportunities where the big builders and regional guys aren't focusing? They're not doing that random infill stuff. You know, a, no. lot of, a lot of the smaller guys, that's where you can really carve out a nice little niche. And that's what I help a lot of people do right now, because you, you don't want to compete with the big guys, because mm -hmm. when the economy turns, they, they are the first sellers, they're the fastest sellers, and they can cut uh, because, you know, they've got the deepest pockets. And then, you know, you don't want to be in a neighborhood where you've taken down 20 or 30 lots and you're competing with, you know, a national builder and they start mm. fire sailing stuff then you're yeah. just kind of stuck. Yeah, very, very cool. Again, folks, you get the opportunity to ask Greg some questions. I got a question from the audience. Uh, Greg, this is, uh, I, I, I've i always told you this, so this is no secret to you. I look at you and think entrepreneur. I look at myself, think employee. So the question is, can entrepreneurship be taught or is it just an innate ability? What do you think about that? Yeah, so it, it's both, you know, so um, I'm a natural born entrepreneur, started out as a little kid, you know, doing whatever to make money, cutting grass, raking yards, washing cars, whatever. You know, the thing about entrepreneurship, it can be taught because what entrepreneurs do is they, they create opportunities, right? They solve problems, create opportunities, you take risk, um, you know, but generally that risk is taken to solve a problem or to make something better. So at the end of the day, you can learn how to be an entrepreneur, um, but, you know, those those elements of risk and understanding that it's up to you, a lot a lot of that can't be taught. You know, that's innate. You have to be willing to do those things. You have to be willing to, you know, be the last person in the food line, right? You know, the-, the You're paid last, yep. You're paid last. And, you, you know, you got to take a lot of risk. And I know when I started my early career, man, you know, all my people were making money. I didn't get paid for a while. Yeah, uh, I remember. You know, so uh, it, it takes a different individual 
Uh, you have to develop yourself as a leader. You have to understand your limitations. You have to understand your strengths and your weaknesses. And you focus your strengths, build your strengths, fill in your weaknesses. But yeah, I think anybody can learn to be an entrepreneur. A lot of that is built innate. But the biggest difference is, is as an entrepreneur, you need to understand it all lives and dies with you. That's the biggest thing that you've got to be willing to accept. It's not up to anybody else. And that's the difference between an employee mindset and an entrepreneurial mindset is that entrepreneurs understand it's on me. I've got to go make it happen, you know, right. and, and I've got to create opportunities. Nobody else is going to do it for me. So those skill sets to do that can be learned. But that ability to take a risk and desire to take a risk and that fire to go make something happen, that can't be taught. That's got to come from within. Yeah, the best test, and again, you were the one that told, you, you You said this, and it was such a light bulb moment for me years ago. You and I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I want to be Robert and Kim. You want to be Rich Dad. You told me that, and I was like, duh, be Rich Dad. I, you know, and it's really funny. We We had that conversation. I felt like an idiot. I went back and read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, again, purposefully, trying to see it how you see it like i think you see it in technicolor i tried to see it and i still i still get to the end of the book and i'm like i'm gonna be rich dad poor dad or i'm gonna be robert and kim sorry and i'm like man i just just we see the world it's you just like you said you're naturally born entrepreneur and i'm a you know i don't know an employee or a beaten down employee or whatever you want to call it it's just it's wild i just can't get there yeah, it's really funny. So a lot of people read that book and they they say, I want to invest in real estate. Like a lot of people get real estate uh, <laughs> investing as their takeaway from that book. Yeah. My takeaway from that book, because again, I didn't have anything. So for yeah. anybody who doesn't know me, I didn't go to college. Nobody in my family were business people. You know, my dad was career military. My mom was Blue Cross Blue Shield for 40 years. Um, you know, I was taught at a young age, if you want something, you need to figure out how to make the money to get it. So I would have to go create uh, opportunities so that I could generate money to buy things. So I knew that, right? That I had to have a business to generate cash flow so I could buy things and consume. As I became an adult, what I understood, especially after reading that book, was I needed to build businesses that generated cash flow so that I could then invest in other sa assets like Robert and Kim were yeah. doing. And, you know, Robert had a little Velcro wallet business and, you know, things like that. But mostly he talked about real estate. So what I saw at Rich Dad was Rich Dad had all the different businesses. He was the one everybody was coming to with opportunities and with problems that he could help solve through investments, equity, coaching, mentoring, whatever it was. You know, these were the opportunities that were coming. But the biggest thing was he had all these businesses, all these different things, and he owned real estate too. And he taught, you know, Robert and his friend, you know, the Rich Dad's son. I can't right. remember what his name is in the book. Um, you know, all these lessons. So that's who I wanted to be. And that's what I set out to do. And I still do it today. Like, and here's yeah. the biggest mistake. A lot of people you are make. rich dad today. Let's be very yeah. clear. You, you and are my rich dad. My whole career. Yeah. And that's what I'm still doing. The biggest mistake people make is they are too quick to want to get out of their job. What they don't understand is your job is your business. Yes. Be a newer in your job and understand that's a cash flow vehicle that can be used to accumulate assets that then can ultimately be, you know, replace your job. So, you know, if you're in a high paying, you know, uh, employee position, embrace that. Think of it that as your business. Especially yes. if you're making 200, 300, 500K or more a year, that's a business, right? And you don't have to worry about anything. You're in a catbird seat. You know, you've yeah. got hopefully good credit. You've got assets. You've got a balance sheet that you can leverage into other assets. The key is quit spending as much of that as you can <laughs> get the bigger house, the nicer cars and this, that and the other to where you're making 500 grand a year and you're broke. A lot of people that make 500,000 to a million dollars a year are broke because they're, yeah. you know, consuming too much instead of saying, you know what, let's cut that in half. Let's live on 250 and let's invest the rest. And a lot of people listening might be going, what is this guy talking about? 500 grand a year, a million a year. If you're making a hundred grand a year, live yeah. on, you know, half of that, you know, or three quarters of that, if you can. And then, yeah. you know, invest the rest into yourself, into, you know, other assets. But, you know, look at that as a business. And then the other thing is a lot of people in business are too quick to see that money coming in and say, I got to put it somewhere. I got to put it somewhere. Mm. Put it in your business and scale your business so that, you know, or other businesses that are ancillary and complementary to what you're doing to generate even more. So then you've got 
you want to get to the point where you got so much cash coming in, you don't know what to do with it. Once yes. you hit that level, now let's look for other places to kind of, you know, put that and scale that. And I'm not saying don't go invest, don't go do real estate or whatever. I'm just saying if you're building and scaling and growing, think about those opportunities first that will ultimately fuel, you know, where you can go with everything else. And that's what I did. I started with one company yeah. and I added another and another. And, you know, eventually I had 10, 12 companies. I was selling them, building them, exiting yep. them, but I had all this cash flow coming in. I started parking it in real estate and just doing real estate. And then I scaled that and used the profits from that to kind of keep going and compound and then started getting into the markets, you know, mm -hmm. and things like that. So, you know, that's, yeah. that's the way to do it. I love all of that. And again, you are my rich dad. When I think of rich dad in my life, you are him. When I got something, I call you. It's, it's just a, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful relationship. So thank you for that. I also am huge on what you said about the W-2 employee. I think it was Ed Milet. Ed Milet was speaking with someone, I forget who he was. And he basically said that less than 10% of the world is a natural entrepreneur. So again, less than 10% of the world uh, are like you, Greg, 90% are like me. But again, if you're like me and you're in the 90%, treat your job like it is a business. I, ha I hate it when I hear people say, I hate my job, I gotta get out of it. Dude, your job for most of us is the key to your future. It, you know, get really good at it. Find a way to make more money. Um, you know, if, you, if you're not getting paid what you're worth there, go get go work for a competitor. You'll get paid more. And then again, to your point, if you can live on half of whatever you make and you could do that for an extended period of time, your chances of becoming wealthy are through the roof, right? It's, it is that simple. Yeah. And that goes back to the whole entrepreneur side of things. Think of yourself like an entrepreneur and entrepreneurs are willing to sacrifice and do whatever it takes to exactly. get to that ultimate vision. Whereas the employee doesn't think like that. You know, the employee mindset is, you know, I get this check, I'm going to consume all of it because that check keeps coming in. Mm -hmm. When you're an entrepreneur, you know, there may not be a check, you know, <laughs> but you have this vision and you have this goal. So you, you know, you keep working towards that. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways, you know, to attack what I said, obviously you can, and the biggest thing as an employee, W-2 employee is, um, you know, taxes, right? So you want to minimize and eliminate taxes. And there's a lot of ways to do that through, uh, you know, real estate passive investments. If you can get real estate professional status, if you can't get real estate professional status and you need to look up what that is in the IRS, you, you know, there's a, there's a um, short-term rental exclusion to where you can own short-term rentals and you can take accelerated depreciation and use active uh, losses in that from depreciation to offset your passive income in other investments and your W-2 uh, income. So yeah, think in ways of how can I, you know, minimize my taxes to the maximum so that I can reinvest, you know, all of that surplus into other things versus mm -hmm. how do I minimize taxes so I can spend more? You yeah. know, so think of it from that way. And, and I'm not saying, you know, give up your Starbucks and don't go out to eat and all that. What I'm saying is, you know, do you really need, you know, a 5,000 square foot house if you got 4,000? Do you really need that brand new Range Rover if your Toyota is doing just fine? You know, when you think about yeah. investing that money, you know, into something else that's going to grow and compound for a few years or something, you know, make some sacrifices in those areas. Take your vacation, enjoy your Starbucks, do those things. Think about how can I make more money so I can enjoy those things. But when it comes to the big stuff to keep up with, you know, the Joneses, just remember the Joneses are still going to be where they're at in five years. So oh, if yeah. you take a different path, well, you know, you could be light years ahead of the Joneses. And then by then you're not going to care about the bigger house and the nicer cars and the jets and all that kind of yeah. stuff, you know? And if you've got the cash flow to enjoy those things, that's great too. But, you know, lease the jet, don't buy it unless you're at an income level where, you know, that becomes a tax write off. And, and yeah, uh, yeah. You, know, you can take advantage of that. It's it's uh, again, folks. I remember being a part of the school me school community gets you some special stuff. Just last week, maybe the week before, we had bomb leg worthy uh, for Maine bean counters on answering your tax questions. We talked about real estate professionals. We talked about short term rental loophole. We talked about accelerated depreciation. So if you want to hear from a tax accountant, great news. Just go to the classroom section underneath special guest. And you can have that full hour of a tax guy talking tax stuff because that's what we do here in the school community. So go get that special gift. Um, I want to talk about, um, I actually want to switch gears into side hustles because another thing that you could do is start a business. Uh, and that will allow you to take some of your monthly expenses and take them to quote unquote above the line from below the line, right? Pre-tax versus post-tax. And 
I think a lot of people are sleeping on this. This is a special, this is like at my core. I'm trying to get baby boomers and Gen X to understand that your side hustle is just waiting for you. I believe if you're, you know, 40 and older, 35 and older, you probably have something you've been passionate about for decades. And in today's world, it has never been easier to create a small business around that maybe call it a side hustle if you want, that, oh, by the way, can become a main hustle. And I want you guys just to appreciate what both Greg and I've done. One of the things that you and I are passionate about is helping people. And both of us have created YouTube channels, right? And that produces income, AdSense. We also realized that once you have a YouTube channel, you can do other things to monetize. And, oh, by the way, we can take things that we would normally spend money on, like Wi-Fi, phones, computers, and other things. And that becomes a tax write of above the line, but both below the line. I, I think a lot of people are sleeping on the ability to use side hustles. So the last thing before I go to you, Greg, is I believe the tax code, the IRS tax code, is written for business owners, not employees. So again, I think Gen X and baby boomers would be very wise to figure out how they could turn their passion into a business. What do you think of all that? Yeah, absolutely. Online and off, you know, so yeah. when, when you think side hustle, a lot of people think online and there's a lot of ways to make money online, YouTube channel, courses, coaching, you know, all those types of things where you can lever leverage your knowledge and expertise uh, because people are, people get it now, right? They understand the value of paying you to collapse time and to fast track my career. I can read your book. I can take your courses, but man, if I can hire you and you can answer mm -hmm. my questions, and reach out to you and things like that. I don't know if you do coaching, but you know, in school and these things that you do, um, I mean, there's no faster way yeah. to get things done, you know, than to have somebody just tell you, hey, here's here's the path. But there's also offline stuff, right? Um, you know, when you talk about side gigs, I mean, anything and everything, just think about it. And there's tons of YouTube channels that talk about that, you know, like Cody Sanchez and Uplift, you know, and just all these different channels that showcase these small businesses, you know, like you know, porta potty businesses or power washing businesses or vending machines. Know, yeah. Yeah. Vending machines. I mean, I've got somebody I, I coach that he does um, uh, tabletop gambling machines, ATMs, you know, those types of things. And I mean, you can buy existing businesses. So what I was helping him do was acquire other uh, businesses in other areas, you know, so he could scale his company. So, I mean, there's just so many different ways that you can do yeah. side hustles. Stay away from restaurants. Yeah, <laughs> don't, 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 don't do restaurants. No, get, don't get in that business right now. Let me tell you, man, that's that's a you know that's squeezing nickels out of pennies if you can even do that. And they're closing left to right now because yeah. of the cost of you know labor and all that. But I mean, there's all kinds of side hustles out there that you can do while you're working a full time job. And that's how I started. So yep. you know, again, I didn't go to college. You know, I didn't. Nobody in my family were business uh, owners. You know, I went in the Navy right out of high school. After I got out of the Navy, I always had full-time jobs, but I always had a side business. For me, it was construction. So I worked in restaurants, you know, back in the early days, and I always had a construction business on the side. And again, is an entrepreneur born or are they built? The entrepreneur is willing to work, you know, 12, 15, 18 hours a day to get going, you know, uh, so that might mean having two or three jobs. Like I always had a main job that I was putting 40, 50 hours a weekend. Then I had the side hustle and none of my side hustles were online. That didn't exist. They didn't exist. It all, yeah. It was yeah. all physical. You know, it was doing what I knew how to do. I had a skill set. So I'd leverage that skill set. When I started my business, it was as a handyman. You know, I was just doing anything and everything. So, I mean, that's a side hustle that, you know, is in demand. So again, entrepreneurs solve problems where there's a problem, there's an opportunity. That's how I started my business. There was a need for somebody to fix little things because nobody wanted to do little projects. So I started doing that. Um, you know, there's just so many things you can do now online and offline. And like you said, it's never been easier. The knowledge and information is out there. And, you know, another huge opportunity is buying businesses, right? Yeah. So there's more people, you know, uh, baby boomers that own small businesses that are retiring and they've got nobody to pass it on to because nobody wants to do a lot of these things that we're talking about. Really great opportunity to go out there and acquire, uh, you know, different types of businesses and you can get them with no money out of your pocket no money at all a lot of times down. Uh, there's a lot of ways to negotiate under financing from the seller. And if they want, you know, $100,000 down or $10,000 down, do what's called a deferred down payment. Hey, Mike, mm -hmm. I'll buy your business. I'll give you a million bucks for it. Business does 100,000 a year, net income, right? It'll pay itself off in 10 years. You want $100,000 down. I'll tell you what, 
how about if I pay you out, you know, 50% of all the profits for the first year, you know, to get you that hundred thousand dollars, you know, you got yeah. nobody else to sell to yeah. your choices are to liquidate and walk away. What are you going to do? Yeah, so, I mean, exactly. there's, you know, you can be creative and just as creative and more so with businesses than you can with real estate a lot of times. And you can get real yeah. estate the same way, deferred down payments, you know, uh, zero interest payments till paid. Hey, I'll pay you a million dollars for your house if you'll let me pay 3000 a month for the next 30 years. Right. Right. Yeah. So if that works for you, you get your million bucks. You know, it works for me. I can cash flow. I've bought buildings with 40 year amortization, zero interest, just payments till paid because they wanted the income. Mm -hmm. You know, so think outside the box. Think where there's a problem, there's an opportunity. That can be with a seller. It can be with a buyer. It can be with a business. It can be with an investment. That's that's how you want to, you know, that's how you're yeah. going to fast track and take yourself to that next level. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it, I've learned over the last couple of years, we've actually added a small business lender to the Rolodex of, of folks that come on every Wednesday, Bo Exting. I call them the concierge to small business lending. And I think there's, I think it, you can get even more creative buying a business than real estate, right? So uh, you can. And the SBA now has, uh, they're doing a new program. I don't know if you've covered that to extend credit for businesses and for people to buy businesses they are making it easier and faster. So oh, yeah. SBA, that's a great loan. It's a great product. Oh, yeah. And it was such a nightmare to get through. But now they're, they really want to encourage businesses. So if you're an existing business, there's a new vehicle coming where you can get access to credit. It's not going to be cheap. You know, that's the only downside to it. I mean, their their rates are up there right now is where it used to be a lot cheaper. But, you know, there's financing out there, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for these things. And it's getting you know easier and easier uh, as we go along. But again, you don't even need any of that. You can just finance directly from the owner. If you find somebody yeah, who's motivated, true. they have Very other true. options. And, uh, you know, it's a win-win for everybody. Yeah. Uh, Cody Sanchez, Alex Ramosi, all these people making buying businesses sexy. So good for them. Uh, again, a lot of creativity out there. A lot of baby boomers retiring. Huge opportunity. Again, folks, remember, you could put uh, questions in the chat or raise your hand if you'd like to ask Greg a question. We're going to go to the chats. This one's from Jason. How do you get your employees to care about your business as much as you do? Or is that even possible? Yeah. So you know, you have to become a great leader first and foremost, right? So so what does that mean? You have to develop yourself. You have to be able to develop a vision. You have to be able to articulate that vision. And you have to, you know, allow people to become part of that vision and part of a movement that's bigger than themselves. But mm -hmm. you also need to understand that everybody's different. Not everybody's going to think the way you think, do the things you're going to do the way you want them done. Not everybody's going to care, you know, as much about a business as you do, but you can get it real close. You know, if there is a mission, everybody's on the same page, you develop yourself as a leader that inspires results out of people and out of the organization. And the only way to do that is to give them, you know, ownership. And I don't mean equity necessarily, but I mean ownership in terms of decision making abilities. You want to find the right people, you want to put them in the right seats, and you want to give them the freedom to impact that goal. So when I built, you know, like you said, luxury homes, when I started that company to build, well, I started as a remodeling guy, grew and scaled it. When I decided I wanted to build multi-million dollar homes, I'd never built a house before in my life. So what I did was I hired people that had been doing it, you know, for many years before me, building the types of houses I wanted to build. So I inspired them to come to work with me, with me, to build this company together that they could run. They made the decisions. They ran the company. I just coached them, supported them, and served them. So you got to become a servant leader. You need to find great people doing what it is you want to do. Put them in a position to operate in their zone of genius and let them do it and get out of their way. That's get out how, of the way. Yes. That's how you can find people that will care as much about your business as you do. But it all starts with you have to care about the individual. You have to care about people. And you need to think of them first. Hey, I want great people that I can support and really be sincerely interested in their success. And that could be a lot of different ways. you got to reward good performance. So you're, you need to give them financial benefits along the way as well. Mm -hmm. But they're going to be looking more for a good culture, a big vision, and to be part of something that's bigger than all of us. That's how you inspire results, inspire people, and get people to buy in You know, just like you. And again, yeah. they're going to make mistakes. They're not going to do everything exactly the way you want them done all the time, but that's just part of business. Yeah, I love that. I love that. So let's let's branch over to where 
there is still a lot of pain coming, a lot of losses to be absorbed, I, a.k.a. commercial real estate. Um, I actually think commercial real estate is starting to bifurcate. What do I mean by that? It looks to me that Class A is starting to retrade, right? Class A uh, stuff, uh, you know, folks are picking that up. Grant Cardone's in there, Ken McElroy, to, to just quote some YouTube folks. Blackstone, Jonathan Gray called the bottom in Class A. So I think that stuff is starting to heal. Lots of office, losses. Or are you what are you talking about? Multifamily, multifamily. Okay. Yeah, so multifamily Class A stuff. Uh, I think the greatest pain, and it's it's not even really started with any great numbers yet, is Class B and Class C. This is not where the big boys play. Um, I think there's a lot of losses coming, a lot of value add, short-term bridge debt. All the stuff you and I warned about 18 months ago is like staring us right in the face. So I'm curious if you see if you see it that way, you see a difference between Class A and B and C, and you know how do how do we maximize taking advantage of the opportunity ahead of us? Yeah, so I would I, I would flip that the other way. So the biggest distress okay. has been already in Class B and C. Class A it just garners the headlines, right? Because you're seeing uh, these Class A office buildings, you, you know, you're seeing these multifamily, but that's generally more institutional. So those haircuts nobody really cares about, right? It gets right. it makes good headlines because a three hundred million dollar building sells for a hundred million, you yeah. know, whatever. The biggest distress has been in Class B and C, but it's under the radar because nobody cares unless it's a syndicator, and then you know everybody's kind of talking about it. But we've seen more of those deals, you know, go back to the bank. And what you know, the, the sad part about that is, you know, a lot of that is just your average, you know, individual yeah. who's investing passively in deals, and they're just, you know, they're losing their investment. Um, you know, just because, I mean, some operators aren't great, but other ones just didn't hedge interest rate risk. A lot of people didn't think rates were going to stay as high as long as they have. Uh, you know, so, I mean, in fairness to a lot of the operators out there, you just couldn't predict what happened. Rates going up as fast as they did, you know, for as long as they did. I think even you and I were surprised how fast rates went up, um, even though we knew they were going up and they were going to stay higher. But uh, yeah, from a class A standpoint, yeah, you're starting to see more of those now because they were more insulated because they had bigger capital behind them. Yeah. They had longer runways. They didn't have, you know, those short-term bridge debt and all that stuff on them. It was a very different profile. So you're seeing a lot of those just get cut from portfolios. Right. So like Blackstone, you know, BlackRock, they're just saying, you know what, we're seeing values drop. The loan might still be, um, you know, productive. It's not in distress or default. You know, it's still, it might be a good asset, but they're just saying, you know, let's just get this off our books before all of these value declinations mm -hmm. start happening where, you know, now we're going to be underwater and in technical default and things like that. So, yeah, it's, yeah. it's very, very interesting. The, the, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, how much longer are rates going to stay this high? Because there's a lot of this debt. I don't know. What is it? 20 trillion, something like that coming due in the next three or four yeah. years. Yeah. You know, it well, has to it, be refinanced it, and worked out. It's just just going to continue to get sold off. And unfortunately, the equity investors, they are getting wiped out at the institutional level. That's, you know pension funds that's people retirement accounts yep. you know it's uh you insurance know, funds, companies life companies insurance. you know yeah. stuff like that they're investing in a lot of those deals hopefully it's not a huge portion of their you know <laughs> uh investment portfolio but still a lot of haircuts being taken out there but is it going to affect banks i think right now there might be half a dozen to a dozen banks that are on the watch list because of their real yeah. estate exposure but the they're end of tiny the day, banks they're just yeah. tiny too yeah. yeah, at the end of the day, you know, that debt is a small portion of the portfolio of the bigger banks. Yeah, let's just put some numbers on that. The, the, the report from the FDIC came out last week. I read it over the weekend. There are 62 banks on the watch list. That is meant to scare you until you realize that their total capital is like 80 billion. 80 billion for 65 banks. That means the average bank is about a billion five. And just for context, Silicon Valley Bank was 263 billion. So 62 banks is like 30% of what we're talking about. So these are tiny also, institutions. Banks fail all the time, just in yes. general, even in just good economy. So like a lot of people here are banks failing. That happens all the time anyways. I mean, I don't know. How many banks are there? Do you have that number? Uh, it's about 4,300. 4,300. I mean, 10, you know, 20 years ago, what was like less than a quarter of that or right around a third of that? No, I, well, yeah, I think, I think a decade ago, certainly during the eighties was the last number I remember it was over 20,000 banks. So we've gone. Oh, through okay. Pretty... So it's come back. So, okay. Yeah. But still yeah, yeah. 4,300. I mean, that's a lot of banks, you know, how many that's banks lot, do you yeah. really need? Yeah. I mean, when you look at other countries, I mean, we're, we're talking dozens in, in other countries of banks, not 4,000. So you're absolutely right. So yeah, banks fail all the time. It's part of the process. 62 banks, $80 billion. It's nothing in the grand scheme of things.
Um, but let's go back to commercial real estate one more time because, um, again, I want to talk about the opportunity. At least in my market, it may be different on the East Coast. We really haven't seen distressed inventory yet. And what do I mean by that? And I'm talking commercial, so five to 50 units, right? Let's just put, I'm not talking residential, five to 50. We're starting to see more listings, but they are WIS pricing, which again is, I think, just part of the process. You're, you're an owner. You bought a property three years ago, bad debt structure. It's now coming due. The bank is telling you, you know, do something. They're they're looking at it going, hey, you could do a cash in refi for half a million bucks, or you could try to sell it. So they're they're now listing them, but they're listing them at wish prices. The bank's probably going to give them a little extended pretend, you know, hey, we'll give you a six-month window to try to sell this thing. And this is exactly what happened in 2010. I, I bought buildings that were listed for two years, and ultimately the bank said, you know, enough. So I think this has just started where I'm going with this question. If we're going to play a baseball game and a baseball game is nine innings, in case you don't know, um, it, when I talk about five to 50 B and C properties, what, what inning do you think we are in um, for maximum pain or maximum opportunity? You know, fifth or sixth. I mean, we're, we're oh, not really? close okay. yet because, yeah. because of what you just said there, you know, there is a grace period, you know, it takes time for this stuff to work through the system. And it depends on, you know, what bank it is, what lender it is, you know, what asset, what market, you know, those types of things. Transactions are still down. I think it's 70 or 80%, you know, yeah, 80%. Yeah. What is it? 80, 80%. Yeah. Transactions are down 80%, but there's still a huge disconnect between buyer expectations and seller expectations. That's why transactions are down. Exactly. Still, still of the mind, you know, that they're going to hang on as long as they can. They think interest rates are going to come down and, you know, they paid higher prices. So they're going to hang on as long as they can hang on. You know, a lot of banks are, are being forgiving. A lot of banks are foreclosing. So a lot of it just depends on the different structures and, you know, where those deals stand. But your question is, where are the opportunities? So it's all about supply and demand. So number one, you need to be ready to take advantage of the opportunities. That's where the yes. first opportunity is. You need to have the knowledge the skills and the resources, right? So what does it take to do deals? Number one, you need the capital, right? Well, number one, you need the deal. So you need you need market knowledge. Number two, you need the, the capital to take advantage of that deal. Number three, you need the uh, expertise to pull that off. Three things you need, right? You need the deal, you need the capital, you need the expertise to pull off the business plan. You don't need all those, you need one of those. So if your skill set is, I know how to raise capital, well then be ready. Okay, start, you know, bringing that and be ready to take advantage of that. Uh, if your, uh, you know, asset is market knowledge, leverage that and start studying your market. Watch for those properties that are sitting. Start finding them before they hit the market. Start communicating with, uh, you know, the REO department and the uh, special assets division of banks. Those are the guys who uh, have that stuff when it gets on the watch list, special assets manager. They're watching these assets before they go into default. They know what's coming down the pike. You know, I get phone calls all the time from bankers. Hey, man, I got this portfolio over here. Are you interested? You know, right. Um, that's their job is get these things off the book before it's a problem. So you want to be on the inside of that in your markets to know where these deals are coming from and where they stand in the pipeline. And the number three expertise, you can be, you know, an expert at the business operations, you know, and, and executing this. And you can pull all those other resources together. But number one, prepare yourself. Be ready with one or all of those three things that you need. And then two, study the market and talk to people yeah. to understand where we're at, you know, in this environment um, and watch that inventory level. You know, it's just like houses, yeah. right? You're not yeah, going to see a shift in, you know, the housing market uh, until you start to see inventory climb. Same thing with these assets until exactly. you start to see deals stack up inventory climb and it just a bunch of things, you know, these things go back. Uh, you're not going to see those opportunities. And when they do, you're competing with Michael Zuber. And, exactly. Greg and all of our <laughs> clients and all the people that we're teaching. So, yeah. you know, just understand that's, that's kind of where things are and you're going to have to jump in when it looks like it's the worst possible time to jump in, but that's when you want to buy. Yeah. This is one of the reasons I initiated the school community. It's only been around about three weeks is I think the next two years are, are going to be where it pays to be, you know, one rental at a time, a Greg Dickerson student, because it does take getting prepared. Like you said, that's the first step you got to do the work. But you also need to be in a community where you can ask a question and get an answer or a response like today, right? When when I first rolled out my course, How to Get Started One Rental at a Time, it was very much paint by numbers, which 
given the environment worked, right? Follow this path. It's worked for the last 20 years. I think the market is changing. It's evolving. The opportunities are different. You still have to block and tackle. You still have to learn your network. You still have to or learn your buy box network. But I think the opportunity to get creative and understand what's going on is, is you know, so important. So that's one of the reasons I created uh, the school community. Yeah, um, that's awesome. Yeah. One of the things that you and I talked about years ago was this small strip center. You know, we're talking non uh, grocery store anchored, you know, maybe six to eight kind of, you know, small stores. I I'm curious, what what are your thoughts on those kind of, you know, brick and mortar, small strips, strip malls? Yeah, those can be great assets. You know, as we saw, a lot of those did well in the pandemic. Um, but that's just your neighborhood, you know, strip center, like you said, could have a Chipotle, a Starbucks, you know, a hair cuttery, you know, a pet split, whatever. Uh, they're usually around 10,000 to 20,000 square feet. They might have, you know, four, five to 10 tenants, those types of things. But the key is obviously like anything else, location, you know, condition, uh, who are the tenants, what do their leases look like, and what are the opportunities to add value? So you need to understand your market dynamics and things like that. And there's different levels of those. You can also do the same thing and have uh, multidisciplinary medical and dental strip centers. Mm, those are great yeah. assets to own. You got an orthodontist, a pedo, you know, a, a general dentist, you know, endodontist, you know, orthodontist. You can have all that in one of those. And you can retrofit those. So maybe there's yeah. one that's dying that's retail. You can retrofit with medical and dental. You know, maybe put an urgent care center in there along with a couple of these other things. So those, look at the things that did well in the pandemic. Those are the things that are doing well now. Office, you know, in most markets in general is suffering, although co-working is doing well in some markets, hmm. you know, so, but that's a retail business model unless you lease it to an operator. Um, so yeah, strip centers are, are great assets to invest in, but you got to be careful. I got a phone call the other day from somebody who bought one, thought he was going to do a turnaround and he can't give it away. You know, mm. and he paid too much for it. It's in the wrong market. He can't get tenants, uh, you know, and his debt's coming due. And, you know, unfortunately, he's probably going to lose a lot, a lot of equity or investor, you know, capital because he did the wrong thing in the wrong market. You know, yeah. so the things that I said doesn't work in every market, right? Not every location is right for every use. Not every use is right for every location. So you need to make sure you understand the demographics, you know, and we talk about this a lot. Market, market, market. You got to know your market. Demographics, demand, uses, what's missing, What's going to do well? What's going to thrive? You know, and then you want to get the best tenant profile in there. Stay away from restaurants. Stay restaurants no are restaurant. the worst, worst business to own, worst tenant to have right now because they're all struggling, you know? And yeah. that, actually right now, there's more restaurants struggling to pay their rent than ever before in the history of, of this economy, even during the I pandemic. I saw that. You know, it's just I crazy. I saw that. Because they didn't crazy. have to during the pandemic, right? So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, we got a question from the audience. The one and only Ryan's raised his hand. So Ryan, ask your question. All right. Thank you for taking the time to uh, come on, Greg. Appreciate it. Um, my question is, what are your thoughts about, so I'm in Toledo, Ohio. What are your thoughts about opening up franchises? So uh, buying existing, if I want to kind of get a head start and uh, buy a business, but go their franchise ways, I'm, not, I'm actually looking at one as far as doing a remodel, but it's on the, I'm trying to think of recession proof. So it's on disaster situations, um, either death or insurance to, to try to, you know, have that hedge against um, if anything happens, you know, with the economy. What, what do you think about that? Yeah. So, you know, on the topic of franchises, so, you know, that's going to boil down to the, you know, uh, franchise itself. Um, you, you know, who's the operator, who's the owner, what does the company look like, how many branches they have, how profitable are they, you know, what's your down payment, what does that look like from an you know, ROI standpoint compared to other franchises. Then you got to dig into what are the royalties, fees, what's the training and support, what's the marketing look like. And then the last thing and the most important thing, which you could start with too, is the agreement. What does that franchise agreement look like? Because that's where they get you, right? Kind of like a gas station. The oil contract is the most important thing in, in a gas station acquisition because that can make or break you. So you just need to understand, you know, franchises are good because it's a proven business model, proven system. You got a path that you can follow and they can be great, but not all franchise ors are equal. Some are very predatory and some are, you know, on your side and want you to be successful. So you need to make sure you're looking out for those right ones. If I heard you correct, you're talking about a restoration, home, home restoration company. Is that what yes. you're talking about? Yeah. 
So that's huge, yes. right? Because there's always fires, there's always floods, there's always those types of things. That's, you know, that's a good business, you know, to be in. And you can do other things too, but man, the restoration business is never going to end. There's always going to be a demand for that. And there's a couple of different companies, you know, uh, in that business that are franchising. So you want to make sure you go with somebody that's got a good reputation. They got great reviews from other franchisees, talk to other franchisees, you know, make sure you understand what's the support like from the parent company, you know, how, how, how much do they support us? You know, um, how well is this business doing from you? Uh, but yeah, that's a great business business to be in and it does well, in a lot of different markets and you can scale that too. And that's the other thing. Will they give you other territories? What are their limitations on you owning other territories, other you know, operations, you know, things like that. But yeah, that's a good business. Thank you. Yeah. One of the things I loved, Ryan, about that story is you're thinking about things that are uh, recession proof or AI proof, um, which is, you know, the right things to be thinking about. So thumbs up. And nice another opportunity is you'll find real estate opportunities in that too, because there's a lot of people that oh, will yeah. call you and then they'll For just sure. decide, I'm going to take the insurance money and I'm going to sell the property. So you'll have the inside track uh, on a, on a lot of those types of things. And I've bought fire damage houses over the years because a lot of people don't oh, yeah. mess with them. So yeah, yeah, that, that could be a really good opportunity. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, Greg, obviously people know our history, know your history, uh, your friends or have friends, acquaintances with the one and only Grant Cardone. You've had him on your channel. You've talked to him. I think a lot of people think that, uh, Grant Cardone was one of the folks kind of out there overpaying, getting bad debt structures, all of that. Uh, I don't think Grant's I don't know anything about his book of business. I don't know anything about any of that, but I think Grant has made it to the too big to fail list. Uh, I think he's, he's, you know, in the top 10 buyers, I think he's going to be brought opportunities. Uh, I don't see any pain kind of with Grant, but people below his level, a lot of the syndicators that tried to copy what he was doing. Uh, I think a lot of those people might get caught. Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on any of that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, Grant and his brother. So he, a lot of people don't know he's got a twin brother, Gary. So I know Gary and, and Grant. And uh, Gary's got a YouTube channel now. He's on Twitter. He's a good follow. He's more into so he was an energy guy, oil, uh, oil and natural gas trader for a number of years, made a ton of money, did very well. Now he's more into, you know, Bitcoin itself, not crypto, but Bitcoin itself. He's also into digital ventures. He's got a couple of different companies. He's a neat guy to follow, but he was Grant's first investor, one of his first mm. investors I didn't uh, know when, when he got started. And uh, they talk about real estate a lot, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the logistics. But yeah, so I've, I've talked to Grant over the years. I've looked at a lot of his deals. The one thing that he does um, or has done over the years is he did a lot of 10-year deals. So he mm. does have some, you know, interest only 10-year debt that has to be refinanced. So some of his assets, he's probably you know, in the next two or three years, he's going to have to refinance or sell, you know, but yeah, he's in a position now where he's got enough. He's not too big to fail. Nobody's too big to fail in the real estate sure. sector, sure. Um, in the real estate sector. Now, banks can be too big to fail, but not real estate. Yeah. JP Morgan's and, not failing. No. Yeah. And, you know, when you get to his level of assets, so it just depends on what his portfolio looks like. And he's been up trading because he's, he understands now mm -hmm. as he went along that there's more safety in the better quality assets, more institutional quality than there is in that class, you know, B and C stuff. But you can go to his website, you know, sign up as an investor and you can download his offering memorandums and see the deals. You can see what yeah. his interest rates are, what the debt looks like, you know. So he's been smart with his debt, but at the same token, like I said, some of that stuff has to be, you know, either sold or refinanced over the next two or three years. He's, he's again, another guy that built businesses that generate a lot of cash flow yes. so that he can supplement, you know, the real estate if he needs to, um, you know, if he gets into a situation, but he's, you know, he's buying better quality assets. He's getting a lot of deals that, you know, where are the opportunities? If you are an experienced operator, uh, you'll be able to come in and just take deals over. So the bank will call you and just say, exactly. Hey, we got this thing in distress. You can take it over. You don't have to put any money in it. We just want you to take it over. So he's doing some of those deals. You know, he's yeah. also, you know, paying cash for some deals and then he, he refinances. Yeah, recapitalizes that with his investors as they go along. So he's he's got a lot of good things going. He's done you know extremely well over the last you know number of years, raised a lot of capital over the years. And here's the interesting thing: again, a lot of people don't know this. He started about eleven or twelve years ago with one building. Yeah. At my age, 56, 55, 56 years old. So here he is now at sixty six, you know, down this road. So that's only been about a ten to twelve year path. And, you yeah. know, you can hear his story where, you know, he started on social media and YouTube. It's what he started with for his businesses. 
And then he leveraged, you know, that into being able to raise capital for these deals and he's still doing it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you yeah. can do a lot in a very short period of time, but you got to get out there and, you know, you got to make yeah. it happen. Yeah. I love that story. And again, it's always the debt structure that gets people again, even if Grant has 10 year debt that comes due in the next couple of years, the good thing for him is he bought the properties eight years ago. So he is way up in the equity position. Yeah. And so it's I don't, all non-recourse. I, That's the yeah. other thing. So, you know, um, yeah. you know, the type of debt and, you know, the recourse is where, is what gets a lot of people. And even though there's non-recourse, there's still a lot of fine print in the details oh, yeah. that can still come back and get you if you're not careful. Not just the bad boy carve outs, but other things. So you yeah. need to really understand the loan covenants and what they can come back to you after. Like if you do a value add deal, you buy it, and you're supposed to put a certain money amount of money in it and you don't, they can come after you for that difference. If you're supposed yep. to keep a certain reserve account, they can come after you for that difference. You know, there's a lot of different things. So you need to really read that carefully. And when I went through 2008 and nine, you know, a couple of my mentors were billionaires. They were two of the largest developers uh, in the region and they got wiped out because they put up all the equity and they guaranteed the debt. So when you're doing commercial and multifamily deals, never guarantee the debt, you know, never guarantee debt if you can, but if you're doing residential, you just can't get around that unless you're, you know, using hard money and private money. And even those guys are going to make you guarantee the debt a lot of times. When you start getting into commercial and multifamily, you know, there's non-recourse debt out there all day long for those deals. It's a little bit more expensive, you know, but uh, you know, that's how you hedge and protect yourself. So if there is a downturn, you know, that's what happens. And and there's really, you know, the only recourse they have is the property itself. Very cool. Well, last question. It was actually a comment from the group. Uh, I think you and I talked privately, at least via email about my Vegas event. I'm now going to host my second event in Las Vegas, President's Day week in 2025. I think it's February 15th and 16th. Uh, I wanted the audience to know I have invited you. Uh, you basically told us, hey, reach out to me late in the year, early next year, and we'll see what the schedule looks like. That's still true? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll see. That's not, you know. That's far uh, away for you. <laughs> it is. It's a, it's a ways out. And, you know, I've got some, you know, different things, you know, not sure where I'll be or what I'll be doing at the time. But, but I have invited you. It, yeah. I appreciate the invitation. I've been to Vegas once in my life when I was in my 20s, and I swore I'd never go back. But <laughs> Well, the good news is the event is not on the Strip. You won't even see a casino when you're there. But in the end, folks, I will reach out to Greg in January and see if we get lucky enough uh, to see him there. Greg, thank you very much for doing this. This is always so wonderful. I love our conversations. Where can people find you? Yeah, gregdickerson.com. That's where all my information lives. And uh, so your event, what is your target audience you know how many people are you targeting for that event 400 400 400 400 yeah 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 interesting cool get it to a thousand and then then we'll talk then we'll talk okay (laughs) i love you man take care of yourself have a wonderful have a wonderful week take care later everyone Bye.